So welcome to the uh, December Sacramento chapter meeting of SEMPTI. And of course, you're always welcome to join SEMPTI. We're always looking for new members. You don't have to, but uh, we'd like to see new members. At this time, I'll go over and uh, introduce the officers for SEMPTI. So the chair is Dominic Jackson, right over there. And secretary treasurer and more, Mona Smothers. She really keeps it together for us. Uh, past chair is Tim Walker. I don't think Tim's here tonight. Manager is Gil Mazzi, that's me. Uh, Scott Maddox is uh, over there. And Sean Case, I saw earlier, okay. Uh, Bob Huddleston is out of town on business, I believe. Patty Leonard is here, there she is. And last but not least, Remington Maxwell. Right over there, okay. So if you haven't done it, please hit the sign-in sheet. We really would like to get an accurate account of how many people were here and uh, send emails to you or whatever. Uh, put on a name tag so some of us that forget names, we know who you are. Um, so I hope everybody toured the museum. That's been kind of one of my projects with low help and uh, really? took a lot of work. So it was actually Steve Bauer's idea. He's my boss and Steve said, hey, uh, Tim Shoulders is at uh, Hirschman and they got a museum. Can we make a museum here? I go, we can and we did. So uh, Lou Dobbins uh, grabbed a bunch of this stuff before me and uh, uh, Mike Betts had held on to stuff. So whenever people got laid off and stuff, I just kind of grabbed things and <laughs> held on to stuff. I was told to e-waste that stuff. There's no return on your investment, but uh, I didn't. So uh, we got to keep it for our museum. So that's good. I had help from Lisa Hamilton, Terry Chamberlain, Ted, Caitlin, and other people. So uh, tonight we've got Jake Smothers recording video here for us, Mona's son, and Ken Schumacher in the back doing audio. So we got microphones, so maybe this year we can hear a little bit, because I know last time it was hard to hear. So we're going to turn it over to Jason Howard. He's got a little short presentation on uh, technically improbable. Hi there, I'm Jason Howard. Uh, I, uh, uh, I'm directing a, a series of uh, documentaries, a three-part series on Grass Valley Tech uh, and the history of Grass Valley Tech. I don't know, some of you may, may know about that. Uh, and uh, uh, I've got the sort of teaser trailer here tonight. Uh, we're um, well into editing the first episode, which will actually, in the series, it'll be the second episode, because that just ended up being the easiest one to, to do. Um, but uh, I've got some cards in the back by the camera. Uh, please take one tonight if you've got uh, Grass Valley stories, uh, tech stories. Uh, definitely hit me up. Um, so I'll uh, jump to the video here. This is a story of gumption, perseverance, and damn luck. It starts with this man. Charles Lytton was Einstein brilliant. He was a genius, made countless contributions to the high technology of his time, vacuum tubes. In 1953, he moved from a young Silicon Valley to Grass Valley, California. I think that's what happens, right? A lot of us, we, we found a way to get to Nevada City Grass Valley, or we found it for the first time, and we don't want to leave. Soon after, he talked his friend, Dr. Donald Hare, into starting his engineering business in the same mountain town. Doc Hare, Grass Valley, I believe came to Grass Valley almost as much for the area as everybody else, but he knew Lytton. Doc Hare and a small cadre of incredibly talented engineers quickly made their mark on a new technology that was captivating the world television. Grass Valley knew how to do things with a transistor that previously took a tube. What came next is decades of innovation, ultimately leading to dozens of spin-offs and related technology companies 
who themselves made countless world-changing contributions. How they, how they got to television is the circuitous path of technology that I don't think anyone would ever predict. The fact that any of this happened at all is technically improbable. Anybody have any questions? Uh, I don't know if anybody saw you had a presentation at the Nevada Theater up there a while back of the second portion. He's doing it in three different parts. So what, that portion was to deal with uh, computerized gaming and stuff. Yes. Yes. Uh, mostly Atari uh, science engineering as well as uh, some other toy stuff that happened up here. Um, and it was, uh, we managed to score some pretty decent interviews. Uh, we got Al Alcorn uh, in that episode, uh, the creator of Pong and uh, co-founder of, of Atari. Um, we got a question in the back. When and, and where will we be able to see these? Uh, so when is a good question. <laughs> it's, a, it's a function mostly of my day job and, you know, artistic stuff that takes time. But I said fall, uh, 19, I'm a software person, so <laughs> you know how that goes. Uh, um, <clears throat> but uh, we're, we're talking uh, the Atari episode probably uh, February, March, uh, and we're hoping to put together a big um, premiere at one of the local theaters uh, as a fundraiser. This is all under the auspices of uh, Nevada County Media, which is formerly Nevada County TV. Um, and so it's all, it's all non-profit. And actually, if you want to donate to the project, it's, you get a tax write-off too, so. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, so yeah, oh, I'm sorry, you had a question. Uh, for me, it's like, it's a really personal story, right? Because uh, I, I got into video in high school. Uh, I didn't grow up here. Uh, ended up writing software, getting into video software. And then I move up here and start working up here. And then I find out that the, the computer that uh, I first started on, the Atari 800, was literally designed in the building right next to me. I'm like, holy crap, somebody has to tell this story. <laughs> so. okay. Right. Thank you. OK, thank you, Jason. So we're going to mimic what we did last time. We did this four years, it's been, since we had a group together and a group of panelists. And we had Ken give his little presentation here. And again, we're turning it over to Ken Royer. He's got a little slideshow. I, I almost don't need it with Jason's good video. A lot of the stuff was in there. So um, yeah, it was four years ago. And then a couple, four years before that, that I did a group, uh, a thing for this group. I think one was at the Miner's Foundry Hotel. We did all this. Anyway, I did a story about um, video in Nevada County, and it was called, um, What Happened to All the Chickens? And it, it, part of it was to talk about Dr. Hare, who we all owe a, a big debt to, and the other founders that are here. And uh, I thought I'd, um, let's see. You, you, if you haven't seen this book, I'm going to read an excerpt from this book, but if you don't have it, Gil has copies in the museum, or we can get them to you. But it's really interesting. It's in a history of his life. And uh, the story I told before was uh, that I'll, I'll get back to. It kind of had to do with how he likes to play poker. And when he left Fresno State, he decided he'd go to Stanford University. And he arrived in Palo Alto with 50 bucks. And that's not going to go far in Palo Alto these days. <laughs> And so he had a job making sandwiches, but needed to supplement that income. And he remembered that he made a heck of a lot of money playing poker with the linemen at his um, family farm, I think it was, somewhere. <laughs> so he decided that might really work. So he walked around Stanford University looking for a fraternity to pledge to. And he came to the parking lot of Alpha Tau Omega. And he saw there was a Stutz Bearcat, really kind of expensive, pretty car. Uh, there's a Pierce Arrow that had the big fenders and a big Lincoln that just said money to him. So he pledged the fraternity and he was um, accepted. And on his first day there, he'd put away his clothes and his ukulele. I didn't know that he played a ukulele, but <laughs> it says so in the book. And he heard about the weekly poker game. 
and this is what he wanted, but he didn't want to be too eager, so he was over playing pool, and one of the guys goes, hey, Hare, do you play poker? He says, well, I used to play a little bit with my brothers, but just for matches, you know, and they said, do you want to join the game? He goes, well, if it's not too expensive, and they had a dime limit on raising. So he kind of held back, lost a few hands, won a few, and did pretty well. So he didn't want to be greedy and get kicked out, but it worked out well. Over the years, uh, over the next couple of weeks, he most, he learned about people. You know, this guy, he always clenches his jaw when, he, when he's uh, got a good hand. This other guy never raised until he had a really good hand. And he kind of got all that figured out. So he started to make more and more money. About the end of the first year, he gets back to his dorm room, and there's a note from the dean that says, come see me right away at your earliest convenience. So he's thinking, well, my grades are pretty good, and I haven't really bothered anybody. Maybe they're going to offer me a job. So <laughs> he goes in, and the dean says, sit down. I have it on good authority that you have uh, a pretty good poker player, and I've had complaints from a lot of the parents that the children have, the students have been losing their weekly allowances to you. <laughs> I said, well, I said, you're going to have to stop this. And uh, he said, well, they started the games. They invited me. You know, it's just friendly fun. And the dean said, no, let me make myself clear. If you do this anymore, I'm kicking you out of the university. So uh, the book goes on to say he was in the debate team and started to rally his defense. And then he realized, no, I'm not going to win this one. And he just said, uh, yes, sir, and left the room quick. So I, I love that story. He... This, this has to do with how he got this property. I think four years ago I told you that, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, this is what I've been told. Remember, I, have, I repeat a lot of hearsay. Um, that when he went to buy, this is the Bitney Springs site, it's about 300 acres, the price was too expensive. So he put in a bid for just, you know, say 10 acres or so at the corner. And he started to spread the word that he was raising chickens, kind of a noisy and stinky enterprise. And after a couple months of this, the, it dropped the price of the property because nobody wanted to buy something near a chicken ranch. And he was able to swoop in and buy the rest of it. So his <laughs> poker playing skills have paid off. And uh, now, is this true? I wasn't in on the actual conversation, but I'm sure he did something interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I just wanted to, then, then it all started. Here he's building um, what I think was Building what? Nine. nine. Hallelujah. Yeah. Uh, how many people have worked in building nine? How many people have met Dr. Hare? Wow. <laughs> I never did. <laughs> um, they had a golf course, nine hole golf, golf, nine hole golf course, and if things were going well, he'd invite you to play. And these are some very just not staged at all pictures. Now, Jason, you had these in your thing. You can also see these very same pictures in the museum. And if you haven't seen the museum, I hope you do. Um, Bill, there you are, Bill. And I think you're in this one, too. Um, just a great early company that, that spun off to a lot of things. Who knows the name of his two dogs? Red, I think. Itsy and red. Itsy and, and red. Start with a K. <laughs> now, I think this is his son, Stephen Hare. Okay. And Corky. Okay. And then this one, I think, is um, Jim Ward. If it's not Stephen Hare again, I can't tell. Is that Jim Ward? Jim Ward. Okay. Oh, oh. <laughs> that's great. Jim. All right. So, seemed like an awful lot of fun. Uh, this is an early Grass Valley, uh, an NAB booth. Um, you all might remember the plane. That was so much fun. A lot of deals were done in the back of that plane. Um, and then in 1984, he passed away on Christmas Day at his computer. But things go on. Um, these are some of the Grass Valley logos that we've had. And it's not just Grass Valley around here. It's everything else that, that's going on. Uh, you might remember uh, Len. Yes. 
and his collection of radios. Has anybody ever seen that? He used to get and repair radios. Graham Patton. Yeah, I think we know that one. We're in their building. <laughs> <laughs> became Miranda, we know. Eigen, I'm not sure of the connection to Eigen, but everybody assures me there is one. Okay. Thank you. Ensemble, I saw Woody here. There. <laughs> Where are you? He left. He left? Oh, okay. AJA, lots of you from AJA. That's the old building. I think it's on here on Providence. Um, it, yeah, it's, it's here, on Crown Point. <laughs> there we go. There's Bob. Where's Bob? Yay. <laughs> Tell the street. Let's go here from there. And then um, Video Cube with um, iMix. And then there are more. And I think this isn't the complete list, but there are, there are more. So I just want to uh, thank you all um, for being a part of Grass Valley and for Dr. Hare and Bill and everybody who founded all this. Uh, so I hope you enjoy the, uh, the rest of the evening. I'm to play this. Okay, I'm going to introduce the panelists now, and we're going to, uh, I'm going to ask some questions to them, and I'm sure some of you have some questions for them. Well, we're going to start with Bill Rorden here, and Bruce, Bruce Rayner, Pete Challenger, Neil Olmstead, and Sally Price. So I'm going to start with Bill Rorden, because he was the one that helped start the company, and uh, I've spoken with Bill numerous times, and he's got some interesting stories, but I'll go over a little bit. Started, you can see it up here, started in 1960. Employee number, there was seven employees, so to was that? To be clear, I was not a founder. The company existed a little over a year before I came in. Okay, do you have him on the, okay, good. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you started, it was Doc Hare and his wife, Hazel? Doc Hare's wife, Hazel, his secretary, Ruth, an engineer, Roy Ham, one technician, and one or two assembly people. Okay, interesting. So I think there were about seven. So people that think I'm number seven, I can't prove that. <laughs> okay. We sounds, did not actually have numbers unless sounds, they had them in the accounting department. It sounds good to us. So, and you were working prior to joining GBG at Varian Associates in Palo Alto. And who hired you, convinced you to work, was Dr. Hare himself. So how did he convince you to go to work hmm? for the company? Huh? How did he convince you to go to work for Grass Valley? 
Um, Grass Valley well, Group. we were introduced by a mutual acquaintance while I was still working at Varian. Uh, I went up there and I basically had an interview with Dr. Hare. He showed me around the company. I knew the area a little bit. I'd driven through there a few times. And I knew about Charlie Litton's building up there because uh, a person I had worked for before was actually a good acquaintance of Charlie. So I, I knew that Litton was up here somewhere. But uh, in talking to Dr. Hare and finding out what his project was, I was strictly a vacuum tube person at Varian. And uh, the only thing I knew about transistors was a few things I'd fiddled around with at home, like building tape recorders and things. <clears throat> when I found out that he was, Dr. Hare was well acquainted with people at Bell Laboratories, had good connections, and, and he was getting into the transistor business, which really interested me. So okay. it was basically a, a complete change of mindset from mm -hmm. from big powerful vacuum tubes to little tiny transistors. So all the products you worked on when you first started were all transistorized. Mm -hmm. No, no vacuum tubes. All transistorized at products. Grass Valley Group. Yes. We the only vacuum tubes we had were in the oscilloscopes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Okay. So you worked 23 years at Grass Valley Group. So your first job, you designed the audio system for Cinerama theaters, and... Yes. The, this was, the Cinerama, which had the big curved screen, three projectors and all that, had eight track sound. And when I went up there and interviewed, he had already acquired a contract with Cinerama to build solid state sound. He had previously, by the way, built vacuum tube systems for Cinerama. They were known to each other. But he had a contract for, I believe, 80 theaters, and there's eight... <coughs> dual channel amplifiers per theater. Okay. So it was a pretty big order. <laughs> right. We don't have one of those over there, but we have a no. similar product. Uh, I don't have any, I don't even have a picture of, mm. of those. It was a mm -hmm. <clears throat> aluminum cooling block with two amplifiers on one block. And the idea was uh, the dual channel was one for the tweeter and one for the woofer. It wasn't, okay. it wasn't and there were eight, a set of eight of those that surrounded the whole theater. They were 25 watt amplifiers. There was a power supply for each pair of amplifiers, and they were all ended up being mounted in the rack. Okay, so you were an engineer? And, and, the, and this was 1960 technology with mm -hmm. transistors. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, Early. All, all of the parts that we were able to buy had two-digit 2N numbers. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. So one of your best memories is working with Doc here. Uh, can you share any stories uh, about working with Doc Hare that were interesting? We're that... Working with Dr. Hare? Yeah. Oh, let's see. I, I remember one time we, we used to go round and round and have discussions, very fruitful discussions about product designs. And one time we came back and I said, I, th I think we've been around this idea before. Uh, he said, yeah, I've been around the mulberry bush. And I said, well, let's short circuit the process. We'll build a revolving mulberry bush. <laughs> <laughs> so um, some of you might have seen in the newspaper recently, there was an article about Bill, 91-year-old pilot, says, I'm going to fly until I don't feel like it. Right. I think that's pretty, pretty yeah. cool. I started flying in, I got my license in 1953, seven years before I came up here. I had a... Cessna 170 at the time. So I flew up here for the interview. Uh, I liked the idea that they had an airport here which would accommodate my airplane. And so I could commute back and forth to my friends in the Bay Area in about an hour. I also moved all my worldly goods up here in the back seat of the airplane. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anybody in the audience want to throw a question to uh, mm. Bill Rorden here? Bill, the transistors that you were working with in 1960 were still germanium, weren't they? No. They were silicon by They're, the time? Some of each. We had germanium PNPs and silicon NPNs. That's all that was available. I remember one of them was a 2N46. <laughs> <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> Bill, was um, sitting around the sound, was that a split system? Hmm? Was that a split system with separate audio, eight-track audio? Oh, yeah. The, the audio was on a, an eight-track mag tape. It was 35-millimeter film that was magnetically coated all the way across okay. with, with eight playheads. 
and a separate uh, machine like a film projector, but it was just a tape drive <coughs> for the audio. And it was synchronized. They had three video projectors. They crossed over and the audio projector. And they, all, they were all tied together by big synchro motors. So when they started one up, they all rolled together, mm -hmm. including the sound. Hmm. We did build some tape head amplifiers and a few incidental things like that, as, as well as the main power amps. We've got a question over here from Randy Hall. Good to see you, Randy. It's been a while. Oh, there was, uh, I don't know, some stories about guns going out, being fired out the windows or something? With Dr. Guns being fired out the windows? No, we did go out to some property and do shooting practice once in a while. We, we definitely were armed and dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hold on, Patty's got a microphone. Your microphone, by the way. Bob loaned us some microphones for the show. Bob's got the Veterans TV truck outside, and he helped us out. Thank you, Bob. You're welcome. I was just wondering if that was the first product for the Grass Valley Group was the, the Cinerama sound? The first product. It was already in design when I joined them. And so what I was doing was cleaning up uh, performance problems and getting all of the manufacturing design lined up. How much later after that were the DAs? The DAs, about two years. Two years? Three years, maybe. Why don't you tell that story about how we, Valley got into it? How it got into video? OK. After. The Cinerama project completed, we were a company with a lot of money in the bank and no work to do. <laughs> so we actually went ahead and designed, and there are some samples in the museum, of a second line of audio products, including a microphone preamp, a leveling amplifier, and a power amplifier. And we attempted, I, I became a salesman at that time, and I went down to Hollywood and tried to sell these to all of the movie studios without much luck. Then a longtime acquaintance of Dr. Hare's was Harry Jacobs, at, chief engineer of KGO. He had worked for Dr. Hare during the war. And they somehow got back together. And he said, this was about 1963, I guess. He said, we've got this convention, the Republican Party convention, coming up in San Francisco. And we need some products that uh, <clears throat> we're kind of having trouble filling. There were a couple of companies at that time that were just starting to make transistorized DAs. They didn't, everything else in video, including all the RSA switchers, were vacuum tubes. So we kind of had Harry come up and, and show us what was needed. And we said, well, we really don't know an awful lot about video, but we'll give it a try. <clears throat> so uh, basically, I went to work and we took an RCA receiver, took it apart, and, and uh, made a monitor out of it, <laughs> as well as a receiver. So we had a video source and a monitor. <clears throat> that was our test. That was the extent of our video test equipment. I designed the distribution amplifier. Found out that there were some extra features, like a, a hum attenuating clamp, that would be useful in a, in a field application. So I managed to design a clamp into the DA, which nobody else had. And we sold those to ABC for the 64 convention. And they said that that uh, hum rejecting clamp saved our butt about 100 times over. <laughs> the whole convention would have been a disaster without it. Because doing a field setup like that, uh, where all the, all the sources don't have a common power source, they don't have a common ground, they said they had hum all over the place. And if they hadn't had those amps, they wouldn't have been able to do the convention. So we were in like that with ABC from there on. We were their heroes. <laughs> hey, Bill. Um, I see some of the uh, DAs or the amplifiers over there have the Ajax control. Could you expand on that, Ajax? <laughs> uh, well, <clears throat> this, this wasn't a clamp in the conventional sense where it just grabbed a switch onto the audio. It actually sampled the sync tip, amplified it, inverted it, and added it back into the, into the video. So there was no direct action on the video, just a signal added back into it. And the gain of that was the Ajax control. You fine-tuned that to tune the hum out. 
Maybe some of the young guys in the building don't know what Ajax is. Can you describe what it is? Yeah. They don't know what a clamp is either. There's no clamp. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Millennials, <laughs> they're in the groom, yeah. <laughs> so Ajax was a cleanser, as we all know, like Comet mm. cleanser to clean the yeah. sink with. So Ajax cleaned the sink. Uh, well, so. that isn't where the name came from. Dr. Hare named it, and Ajax was actually a, a Greek mythical figure. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Didn't know that. Okay. That's where I it heard came it the from. other way. Yeah, okay. we, had, we had another product we called Apollo. I like my story better. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and uh, Apollo, th this was a device which, uh, in those days, a lot of video came from cameras without sync on it. It was just video mm -hmm. and blanking, and, and sync was added in later. And then machines like tape recorders came along that already had sync on them. So... <clears throat> ABC told us that they sort of had a problem with how to manage this. It was getting to where you, you had to switch between these different kinds of signals. And they, they said it would sure be nice if the box had some smarts to figure that out. Well, I looked at it for a while, and I forget, I think Frank Haney was the engineer back there. I said, yeah, I think we can do that. I think I can see it on a scope. I should be able to recreate it electronically. You know, that was my that was my logic. I can see it on a scope, so okay, there must be a way to do it. <laughs> so I agreed to build them a prototype. Actually, an engineer back there swore on a stack of Bibles that it couldn't be done. <laughs> this is impossible. So two weeks later, I sent him a prototype. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to move along and, and come back to that, Bill. But can back to the night. name, that was called Apollo, which was the Greek god of wisdom. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, so Bill, that was I've the got, origin of some of our names. <laughs> I've got a question for you, Bill, that you didn't mention. Is there some truth that you had to inquire of ABC down in San Francisco as to about the sink polarity when you were building this? No, actually, we, we uh, made contact with Herb Hartman, the chief engineer at KCRA, and asked him which way sync went. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't know. We, we knew which way it went when you took it off of a video monitor, but when you got down to the video, b baseband video, we didn't know what the amplitude was right. or the sync right. went or right. anything. So we had to ask. <laughs> hey, Gil? We have, you, we have to tell uh, the Dr. Hare's quote uh, that goes back to that era that we have on video still, where he's talking about this whole thing with uh, ABC, you know, KGO and all the rest of it. And, and he, said, he said, that's really how we came to be in the business we are, because Grass Valley Group was an audio company. But in audio, there were a lot of schlocky companies around making cheap stuff. And uh, we kind of discovered that in video, there were a lot more stupid people, and they pay much higher prices. <laughs> and that's how we became a video company. <laughs> yeah, I like that's that. true. It appeared that we could build the video products more economically than the audio products and sell them for twice the price. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but we actually have Dr. Hare on videotape yeah. telling that story. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm going to move along. We'll get back to you, Bill, because I'm sure yeah, everybody on. is very interested mm -hmm. in... We could spend an hour with each one of these mm -hmm. panelists. But uh, we're going over to Bruce Rayner now. So I've got your bio that's in front of you here. I don't know that I can read all this. There's a lot of stuff. <laughs> so you started in 1969, 38 years, came from GE Syracuse Video Systems. Uh, who convinced you was your buddy Bill Rorden to start... Yeah. yeah. He worked I don't 20 know why, but I did. It's your fault, Bill. <laughs> well, I, wa I found that Grass Valley, I was working for GE. The interesting thing, there was a lot of schlock equipment. Riker and uh, a few of their other outfits that have been playing around with transistors. And this stuff just didn't uh, work. And so uh, I ordered up a sample of a video processor from Grass Valley, and they sent it up, and I said, hey, guys, there's something wrong with this thing. It works. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it just makes a, everything look, uh, look perfect. So I became interested in the, in the uh, company, and uh, when 1969 NAB came up, 
I uh, was working for GE, but I took my own time, drove down to uh, uh, Washington, and then snuck over to, you're not supposed to go to somebody else's booth when you're working for GE. But at any rate, I went over there and said I was uh, be interested in coming and working for them. Are they hiring? And I said, yep. And uh, that was probably uh, Steve Hare, Dr. Hare's son, yeah, that said that. Know. So at any rate, uh, I was invited to sit down on this big overstuffed brown cushion uh, sofa, overstuffed thing that kind of tilted back and left me like this. And here's <laughs> Bill Rorden sitting at the other end. He was interviewing me. Well, at any rate, so um, a few weeks later, well, I got offered a job. And sight unseen, I said, any little company that has to do stuff like that can't be all that bad. And everybody teases, oh, they'll fold within a week. You know, they're, <laughs> they're gone. So at any rate, that's how I got to Grass Valley. OK. And your first job was a systems engineer. What did you do? Well, a systems engineer took these switchers that had been built and um, gee, set them up so that uh, they would work. Cause, uh, if you didn't put a scope on these things, you really didn't know what they did. And in spite of the fact that there are a lot of stupid people out there uh, buying them, if the signal didn't get through and look reasonably like it did when it came in, uh, you know, they were going to call up and complain. So uh, very quickly, I followed the first system engineer, which was Merv Graham. And uh, so he and I. Uh, Worked day and night to get these switchers on a scope looking pretty good, and we shipped them out, and people liked them. So, okay. So, key positions you held was man, you did a lot of stuff there. Um, design development of 1400, 1600 switchers, uh, borderline title generator, design and implementation. I know you're from EMAMS, so EMAMS is. Uh, 1600, their claim to fame there. Maybe you can tell us the story about how you thought about uh, an EMAM. Do, do you remember what triggered that? Well, that's a long story. I'm trying to figure out how to shorten up. But that was uh, kind of interesting in, in that there was a period there in the early 70s where uh, some people got in an uh, experimental board. For, it was a Motorola 6800 processor on it. And gee, the opportunity came to look and see what this thing uh, could do. Meanwhile, when we went to NAB, we would look at uh, companies like Vital and CDL, and they were starting to use microprocessors in their uh, system. But so far, Grass Valley didn't have uh, any uh, computerized stuff. So anyway, one thing uh, led to another. And the short story is that we figured out how to, uh, um, to make a microprocessor controlled memory for the effects that people were trying to uh, do on these switchers. Even with the old switchers that you see in the other room there, imagine somebody trying to uh, put together an effect on the spot for, uh, you know, live video. It was all live video uh, in those days, and it could be done. So the <coughs> idea was we came up with a way to push one button that would reset essentially the whole switcher. So uh, that kind of uh, caught on. We took it to NAB, and I remember uh, Roger Goodman from ABC came by and saw that demonstration and he made us repeat it because we did this half hour demonstration. He says, we want that for this season's baseball mm -hmm. uh, coverage. And I said, well, you got to talk to this guy over here. Because <laughs> he, they said, no, 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 there wasn't any budget to do this. And it would take a couple of years to do it. Well, we'd kind of done it in a few months, just a sample of it. But they said, no, no, we got to have that to show up our competition. And we needed to do a promo uh, commercial that we can put on this spring for the baseball season. 
what do you propose? He says, well, we're going to go talk to Ampex, and we're going to get one of the machines down here. No VR, not 1,000, but the second, second one, whatever it was. 2,000. Yeah, OK. So uh, I said, well, OK, I don't see any reason we can't <coughs> connect up your switcher. So son of a gun, a couple nights later, as the show doors close at 6 o'clock or something, all of a sudden I look down and rumble, rumble, rumble. Here comes this forklift of this cart with this huge VR 2000, half as big oh, no. as a pickup truck, <laughs> rolling down the aisle. And these ABC guys along with it, they push it up, plug it in, and I got to TD for uh, the uh, ABC uh, baseball previews. And uh, um, well, the rest is history because they said, we got to have this. And, so guess what? That became a product. <laughs> okay, so also I show here, you were uh, um, doing demo shows, 84 and 85, for the first NAB display using the dual wide screen projectors, which we have pictures of that in our uh, museum over there, which is quite interesting. But any interesting stories about having any technical difficulty with that, setting it up? or? <laughs> You're talking about the, the dual projector? Yes, yes. That was 1984. That was the 25th anniversary. Mm -hmm. And to do something uh, special. And, well, somehow I got involved in the thing. Anything that smacked like fun, you know, you get away from a ring roll, that, that was worth <laughs> looking at. So I uh, decided that we needed to do something uh, different, and maybe we could take a couple of the uh, what were fairly new then Betacam cameras, which could produce a pretty good picture. But this is all this old-fashioned SD, uh, you know, uh, low-resolution stuff. Nobody ever like dial phones. Nobody knows what that is anymore. <laughs> and um, so, uh, decided that maybe if we took a couple of those and put them together on a platform, we could put two pictures side by side, and it would make a really wide picture. And in the end, we did that uh, on this big wide screen. I think it was really the first demonstration of what true high definition could look like, because it was uh, two pictures wide. Um, the problem was, there weren't any projectors in those days, mm -hmm. short of this thing called an idaphor which weighed as much as a pickup truck, and they used it for basketball games and what have you to put uh, screens up and so forth. That's about the only thing they, uh, they had for that they cost type half of a projection. Dollars. Hmm? They cost half a million. Oh, thanks. Add that in. <laughs> well, but we didn't need one. We need two. <coughs> well, just like Sony, if you told another manufacturer that, hey, we'll give you good coverage here, yeah. we just need to borrow some equipment. Sony didn't realize that we were going to take two of their $75,000 cameras, put them in a box that we thought might be watertight, and send them down to Grand Canyon. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Later, when we did the show the next year, we tied these things to the front of a Hobie cat That's and went right. out sailing off of uh, Hawaii. Uh, the, uh, Kauai. And I remember uh, accruing on the back of this thing, and we're tipped up. Uh, I'm like, man, and I'm looking and the waves are washing over. Here's this plastic box, which I knew exactly was quarter inch plexiglass. See, the waves are hitting this thing. I said, how long is it going to last? <laughs> well, well, we don't need to tell Sony. They wouldn't believe us anyway. But anyway, we came out of that uh, fine. But the, uh, uh, the, back to that show, uh, we had to borrow not one, but two of these huge idaphors. They had never tried to match two of them together. They made color pictures, but the colors were all different. They had somebody there from uh, the company over from Switzerland yeah. trying to set those uh, things up. And they finally did it. And we rolled uh, a couple of uh, uh, videos. Now, actually, that was really also Grass Valley's first introduction to video editing where editing before was a matter not quite cut and splice like they used to do with film, but still it was making uh, two pieces of video 
switch at the same time. Because even one frame off, if you're, you can't see it if you're looking at it normally, but one frame off and they're both going together, your eyes begin to do this kind of thing. By golly, they got the president of the company, Dave Bargain, to come up and sat there for hours and hours trying to make that thing edit accurately. And we finally did it and produced the master tapes, took it to, um, oh, that was Vegas uh, yep. that year, and rolled that thing off, this big wide picture going down the, uh, the American River and uh, then some shots that also went in, uh, did some Hawaiian stuff there too. But uh, I looked out at the crowd one time and as we went down the canyon and flying the, the helicopter down the canyon, you could see everybody in the audience going like this. And I, was, <laughs> I, th I think we got a winner. <laughs> So we had a lot of fun. I don't know how many products you sold, but uh, you but still hear people. Time. What? We had a good time. Yeah, we had a good time. That was it. That's right. Was that magic? Did you yeah. have the, no? What? It wasn't the magic here then. No. It wasn't. The, what? At the music. At the music. Oh, the music. It was the police. Was the music done. was the uh, police was the synchronicity. Police magic, right? Beforehand. Yeah, it was, no, it was yes, just, yes. We the got music it. for the Grand Canyon was especially written by Roger Hodgson. From Roger Sinatra. Hudson and his studio put it together and composed it for it. Yeah. And uh, that's really what made it. That was great. <laughs> and uh, still the, ori the original masters to that material are sitting around. It's one of my uh, retirement objectives <laughs> to get a hold of those masters, uh, re-edit them in HD with the original music and put together a, uh, a SMPTE program for that. So we might all see the 25th anniversary recovered there. Yeah. Sounds good. <laughs> and time for the 75th anniversary. Yeah. Well, that's possible, yeah. Hang in there. yeah right. Okay, so we can all see on the screen here other things that you did, and then later in life you owned uh, Timeline Designs, selling uh, video editing equipment, um, designed truck conversion motorhomes. So he did a little bit of everything. <laughs> well, that's, that, that's kind of an introduction to say that I kind of found that I was the kind of person that wasn't really satisfied the way anything worked and that there should be a better way. Of course. And so probably at the irritation, though I wasn't too sensitive to irritation, like of the people in draft ads say, no, I don't think we want to do that. We want to move over here and do it this way. You know, oh, no, and so forth. At any rate, uh, and then people who uh, would say, well, we need to do it this way. No, 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 we really haven't got the money. That would have been Jim Ward saying, you need a, no, 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 no. Then what the hell is Rainer doing now? We can't have this. So uh, my paycheck, I think, came from engineering most of the time. But maybe nobody else wanted my help. <laughs> and so, anyway, that's kind of the way it went. As a result, some of these fun things, as you point out, were born of, uh, it's kind of dull boring back there. What can we do that's fun? Now let's go get a helicopter and fly down the Grand Canyon. <laughs> okay, do we get a question or two out of the audience for uh, Bruce? Anything we didn't cover? Okay, we'll move along. We got a full panel and we'll come back. Next up is uh, Pete Challenger, um, 1980, uh, employee number, who knows? Uh, prior was tech in the UK. What were you doing for tech? Selling GVG switches. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's how, that's how I ended up here. Um, okay. I came over with uh, engineers in the UK who were buying 1600 switches. Uh, and in those days, everybody came over to do acceptance tests because you had to yes. make sure it was yes. going to work. <clears throat> so I came over here accompanying them. And first or second trip out here, Len Dole says to me, you ever thought about moving out here? <laughs> and very casual, very low key. And I said, yeah, maybe, I don't know. Very casual, very low key. And internally, what was going through my head is, OK, I get paid a lot more money here. The cost of living is lower. The weather's a whole lot better. It's kind of nice around here. Hell yes, I'll move out here. <laughs> so I did. Okay. 
Uh, so Lynn was the one that pulled you here, worked here for 10 years. Uh, first yeah, I, I, should, I should say, people say to me, what years did you work for GVG? And I can never remember. And I say, I, I don't think in calendar dates, I think in terms of product families. <laughs> so I came out to help launch the 300 switcher and I left in disgust when the 3000 came out. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my, uh, my 10 years. <laughs> so first job was Latin American sales. Um, any good stories about <laughs> should, should dress tell you a story about Latin American sales? So my, you know, I'm a young kid from the UK, sort of getting used to living in California. Fairly early on, I make my first trip to Latin America as a sales trip. So I go down, <clears throat> first international business trip I've made. I hang out with the Mexican distributor, who for those of you who go back, way back, his name was uh, Rafael. Um, and he was crazy, of course, but uh, um, so the first night we, he says, oh, well, we, I take you out tonight. I'll pick you up later. So he comes to the hotel and picks me up about mm, nine or 10 or something like that. And uh, eventually, after a few rounds of drinks, we go out and have dinner. <coughs> and then after dinner, about maybe one o'clock or something like that, he says, okay, now we go to the club. <laughs> So he takes me to this place called the King Kong Club <laughs> in Mexico City in a fairly disreputable part of town, which is about the size of an aircraft hangar, full of tropical vegetation, very loud music, absolute chaos. And, uh, and, and uh, so we're sitting there. I'm sitting there with Raphael and Raphael's English teacher and Raphael English teacher's friend who's come to keep me company. So the four of us are sitting there in a group, and then King Kong comes in behind us and puts his arms around us all. Um, and by that stage, I, I wasn't exactly, you know, I was almost conscious, but I certainly had no recollection of what was going on. <laughs> and I didn't really think anything of it. And, you know, it was only later I found out how infamous that club was because we're at Televisa the next day, you know, the biggest Latin, uh, Spanish broadcaster. And Rafael is prattling on in very fast Spanish to the director of engineering for Televisa. And he, blah, 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 blah. Uh, the guy's got like this. And Rafael, blah, 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 blah. King Kong Club. King Kong Club. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I thought, oh, OK. This is obviously well known. So what I didn't know is that Rafael had had a picture taken of the group of us with this King Kong behind us and sent it back to Bitney Springs Road, where it was plastered all the bulletin boards <laughs> all over the building. <laughs> so. so how about, um, I know last time you told the story in told Japan or stuff. Japanese. How about any Asian stories or Japanese quick uh, little? Well, I told a bunch of Japanese stories last time. I should tell some uh, Hong Kong or Chinese stories. Oh, sounds good, for, for yeah. Different. <laughs> um, there's a few interesting ones. It was, first of all, you know, a lot of this stuff was hugely educational for me and probably would be for most people. Um, so uh, one example of that is that we, we needed to hire a really good support engineer in Hong Kong because uh, we were opening up you know, GVG Asia in Hong Kong and having a support guy was a big deal. So Michael Chang, who was the guy who was going to run uh, GVG Asia for us, started searching around and he called me up one night and said, well, there's this guy I've been talking to who'll be absolutely perfect. He's fantastic. He's a really good engineer. He, he'd be totally loyal to us, all the rest of it. But of course, we couldn't possibly hire him. So I said, well, why couldn't we possibly hire him? Is he too expensive? And, and he said, no, 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 we could meet the budget. I said, well, what's wrong with him? And he said, well, he's short. <laughs> and I said, I, I, it took a while before I realized he wasn't kidding. Uh, and, and he basically was saying, you couldn't possibly hire him because he isn't very tall. Uh, and so um, in the end, we had him. And he was the most loyal employee we had because he just thought we were wonderful to be able to look past the fact that he was short. <laughs> how tall but, was he? Oh, uh, he was, how tall do you think he was? Uh, oh, he, was, he wasn't even. 
might be. His bid at four four eight or something. Yeah, I mean it was it was short. Yeah. <laughs> but he was a great engineer and he was a good great engineer. So the uh, the other story I might have told last time, I can't remember, but it was um, it was an illustration of how difficult field conditions and high technology don't always mix. Um, because we, it was the very first demo in China. We took a 1600 1X, <coughs> which was the first switcher to have a built-in EMEM system. And we took it to Guangzhou, um, and we were doing a demonstration. And, and the, you know, this is way, way back when um, you know, there were hardly any cars in China, let alone anything else. You get mown down by the bicycles, but you know, cars wasn't a problem. So we're at this TV station, which is primitive, you know, wouldn't be too far from the truth. It was, you know, an, an old building and all sorts of work was going on and, and the electrical system was not great. But, so we, we bring up the 1X and we, we get things going and everything's looking good and a group of people comes in for the first demo. And as I'm about to press a button, all the lights on the panel go out. And it reboots, which is, you know, a bit disconcerting when you're trying to do a demo. So I wait. It comes back up again. I check everything. It's all working fine. So, okay, we'll start the demo now. I go to press a button. All the lights go out. So the third time I did this, I, out of the corner of my eye, I saw this little flash. And it turned out that the power line that was running the 1600 was also running an arc welder outside. <laughs> <laughs> and there was this correlation. Every time he drew an arc, it reset the CPU. <laughs> so, it was like, OK. <laughs> so after a little bit of negotiation, the, um, the arc welder went on an early lunch, and we concluded the rest of the demos. <laughs> but, um, it's like. You, you couldn't, you know, you couldn't pay to get those kind of experiences. <laughs> it was just magic. Okay, we got a question out of the audience here from Randy Hall. Well, I got a follow-on story to his uh, Japanese okay. stuff. Okay. <laughs> so I go over to uh, Japan. Pete sells the first 300 that goes into an edit bay over there. This is probably in 80, 81. Right. You know, I'm kind of tall. The door to the edit bay is about like this. <laughs> On the other side of the door, for about three feet, is the air conditioning duct. So I walk in like this every time. Very polite. So I come home, and by then the, the telexes or whatever is passing back and forth. Peter says, he says to me, "You were very polite in there. You bowed every time you went into the edit." Bay. <laughs> 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 Anybody else have a question or a story they'd like to share? <coughs> Patty, can you give them the microphone down there? Here you go. Uh, yeah, you mentioned that uh, you were here until the 3000 came out. I, I was here until just before the 3000 came out. Okay, so <coughs> there's a lot of horror stories floating around about the 3000, which was a composite digital it switcher? It was a composite digital switcher, which is why I was so disgusted. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. However, I was telling this to somebody earlier, it could have been worse um, because about uh, probably a year and a half before that, there was a product planning meeting that I went to. Uh, and I was you know, young and wild and not always polite or restrained in my opinions at the time. So, so we go to this, this planning meeting where there's a discussion going on about the what switcher is going to replace the 300, which was obviously very important for the future of the company. So you've got all the senior executives there and a couple of other people, including me, who've been invited to give opinions. So I look at what's being proposed. So they've been working on it for a year and a half. There were detailed drawings, all sorts of things. This new, new switcher was going to come out. And I can't remember exactly what I said. I mean, what I thought was, this is a piece of shit. Um, and I was slightly more polite than that, but not very much. So the reason that I was acting that way was 
with the best will in the world, it would be two years before this thing you know, saw the light of day at an NAB. And not only was it going to be a composite switcher, it was going to be an analog composite switcher. So there were, the, the idea was there was going to be a brand new, very large, very complicated, all analog switcher that would have been coming out the same year the 3000 came out. And I was just saying, we're going to be a laughing stock, basically. You know, it's just insane to believe that the rest of the switcher world is not going to do something digital in that kind of time scale. And um, so I did at least get a little bit of momentum going. So, it, so the, the analog bit got killed off. But unfortunately, the, uh, the composite survived. Sad, but true. Uh, if I may, the second sure. half, um, and it kind of dovetails with the, 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 the Japan stories uh, and the 300. Anybody here shed some light on the 300 HD analog switcher? Oh, and, I can tell you about that. <laughs> and if that prompted Sony to actually get into the switcher business? Uh, they were going to get into the switcher business all along. There, there, was no, there, was no, there was no question. They were just, they were waiting for a transition from analog to digital before it was worth their while to get into the switcher business. So they were going to do it anyway. Um, they did, however, persuade us to do an HD analog 300, which, for those of you who saw it, was an interesting contraption. Um, it did work. It was very large. It did uh, require a certain amount of adjustment and set up periodically <laughs> to be stable. And, uh, and a lot of money was spent on it. And sadly, it ended up in the Nevada County landfill, <laughs> which is very sad. But. I'd like to jump in here. Sure. As the project manager who got the 3,000 3, shipping. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Engineering manager. The 3,000 was a troubled project. And after a period of time and people at the top uh, spending a lot of time deciding who was going to do what, uh, this troubled project uh, got my way. <laughs> they asked me if I'd take it over because it wasn't getting out. It wasn't getting shipped. I got it shipped within two months of starting that project. Uh, it was a troubled project because of the fact that management couldn't seem to figure out which division was going to handle it, who was going to do anything. <laughs> but in the end, uh, with a few strong decisions, it got shipped. And I'll make one other comment about uh, HD. Uh, IBC would have been 19, I was trying to think, 90, 89 or 90, uh, I was asked to take over a small project to get an HD switcher to IBC. And uh, this was an analog switcher in conjunction with Sony and uh, took a uh, Model 100 CV and tweaked right. it. Uh, got it out to a little over 20 megahertz bandwidth, which was pretty amazing for that switcher. <laughs> and in looking at the monitors, we couldn't really tell the difference between 20 and 30 megahertz. And so right. we took that to IBC uh, and worked in conjunction with Sony, and then uh, they kind of let the whole analog thing go at that point. But we did get an analog uh, HD switcher out and showed it at IBC that year. Well, congratulations. <laughs> Good. I don't know about that. And I, I, I should say you obviously deserve some congratulations, because th as I remember, the 3000, as it first went to NAB, had two compact 386s that were required to run it. <laughs> that later on perhaps got incorporated. And wasn't that, that was the first one. That was before we actually got it into shipping mode. Right, right, yeah. There it was were 16 software engineers and two hardware engineers, John Apt and uh, Brian Dunbar working yep. on it. But it was mostly a software project and uh, took a little doing to get that thing out the door. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, I think I'm going to move, move along on. to uh, Neil Olmsted. So, it's all Neil's fault. Neil yeah. started in 1975, employee number 295. Of course, you knew your employee number. Uh, the short ones are easy to remember. Institute of Technology in New York. What were you doing there before you came out here, Neil? 
Uh, I was in engineering uh, towards the end, uh, well, sort of in charge of the uh, production studio at the college, okay. and uh, was a Grass Valley Group customer. Um, one day, the Grass Valley Group salesman stopped by. He had a circuit. He'd stop by about every six weeks or so, and uh, indicated that there was a job opening in Grass Valley for a field service engineer. Before then, there were no field service engineers. The, the uh, engineers themselves had to be tapped to go out and help out a customer if there was a problem. So I decided, what the heck, I'll give it a try, come out to Grass Valley for uh, about 18 months, and then reevaluate my situation. And the rest is history. I <laughs> so decided you were with to stay. Grass Valley for 42 years. Working right. in this building up to two and a half Whoa. years ago. <laughs> so being a field service engineer, I just know you as a design engineer. I didn't yeah. know you did that. And yeah, the first three-ish years, uh, I worked for marketing. Okay. Bob Kobler hired, hired me, and Gordon Fellows was my first manager. And three years of constantly on the road wears you out, as Pete knows all about that. <laughs> And uh, I moved into engineering, hardware engineering. Was there ever since? Okay. Yeah, I worked with you many years, fourteen years with you here, and uh, um, a lot of progress. We really miss you, by the way, man. Big hole, <laughs> big hole to fill. You know, we got some new people coming in, but still, there's holes in the design area. Um, Key positions, so field, first field service, followed by hardware design engineer. So you mostly worked on production switcher control panels, video processors. So what was your favorite um, production switcher control panel that you worked on? Um, Zodiac. Probably. Zodiac. <laughs> it wasn't a huge success in the marketplace. We did sell mm -hmm. a bunch, but um, Zodiac was the most I've, fun as far as design. I've got one in the right. museum and it's the one panel that I lift up to demonstrate to people, look at how clean the layout is, look at what Grass it's Valley so <laughs> did. Uh, a lot of the other ones, you don't want to open them up. A lot of The, the only thing I didn't like about it was the damn pink Pepto-Bismol button on it. Okay. On <laughs> other than that, it turned out okay. Okay, so um, you missed the first years of GBG before tech. Favorite memories at Bitney Springs? Uh, what, what? Share one or two of those stories out there from Bitney. <clears throat> a would. couple events come to mind. Uh, one was in the roll-up to the 1980 Winter Olympics in Lake Placid. That was uh, produced by ABC. A few weeks before the event, uh, ABC had a whole bunch of the remote units in a warehouse in New Jersey. There were half a dozen tractor trailers in this warehouse, and one of them caught fire. And the, fortunately, the fire department had visited several months prior and were familiar with the layout of the building. And so they showed up uh, with the smoke coming out, out of the building, and they had the presence of mind to <clears throat> crawl around in the smoke and find the keys to the tractor for the unit that was on fire. And they pulled it out of the building before they started up the hoses and the foam and everything. So it saved all the other units. However, <clears throat> several of the units had their doors open and the smoke damage was incredible. Uh, so one unit I went out to work on, because they're in a panic mode because it was just a few weeks before the Olympics, and uh, assessed the situation. And we decided that the smoke was so bad on the circuit boards that they needed to be cleaned. So we sent some guys out. They went to Sears, bought a dishwasher, <laughs> and one of these tin sheet metal garden shed things about, I don't know, 15 feet by 15 feet, set it up in the warehouse. <clears throat> we took all the boards out of the 1600 switcher, ran them through the dishwasher, 
one cycle on with some kind of heavy duty cleanser and then about three cycles of water and then moved them into this uh, tin shed with a whole bunch of electric heaters in there to, <laughs> to dry it out. And two days later, we grabbed all the boards, slammed them back in the frame, and it came up working. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it didn't even need alignment. It, it, it just passed spec. It was, it was terrific. So we sold that we sold that product as being waterproof, also then, huh? Yeah. Well, I caught the idea of the dishwasher because in the building four assembly area, in the lunchroom, there was a dishwasher, and they'd wash boards in, in the dishwasher. Right. Yep. Yeah. So it, it worked out pretty. It was a happy ending story. But. So. You worked out at Bitney, and you worked at Providence Mine for quite some time. Uh, right. Um, which place did you like the best, and why? Well, Bitney, I preferred. Um, the commute wasn't that good. The, the old Bitney Bridge was interesting <laughs> in, in, the, in the winter time, <laughs> but the the campus was fantastic. So, and <clears throat> I spent a fair amount of time working in Building Four, which is the one that looked out across the valley. And on a couple occasions, I managed to have a desk with a window view. And so that was fantastic. In, you know, when you look back on things, you think, oh, those are the good old days. Well, when the good old days are happening, you don't know that. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but that was an enjoyable time. Magic. There was another uh, program that I participated in as a field service engineer, and that was the infamous 1620A retrofit program, which Randy knows all about. And the original 1600 switchers had a uh, mix, mix effects amplifier, and that was responsible for combining the A video and the B video to produce a program output from particular mix effects. And it was like an order of magnitude better than previous technology, the com competitors and whatnot. But Jerry Taylor came up with a new design for that mixer involving some feedback, which made it an order of magnitude better in performance, linearity, cross-fade uh, performance. And it made the original one look kind of sad. So we had a deal going to customers that had received the old version that if they would take their switcher out of service for somebody to come out, me or Randy mainly, to put in these new amplifiers, uh, we'd do it for free. And <clears throat> I scheduled one day per mix effects to, to do the job, so typically it would take three days. <clears throat> And about 100 customers took us up on that. <laughs> and that sold a lot of switchers. Yeah. So it, it was a good investment. <clears throat> Seeing uh, Jim here tonight reminds me, <clears throat> one of those customers was in New Zealand. And uh, Jim's family is from New Zealand. Jim's from New Zealand. So I was packing my bags, getting ready to go, and I, I had this mountain of test equipment, which in those days, uh, excess baggage on an airplane was pretty damn expensive, but it had to be done. So I had this mountain of test equipment, and <clears throat> Jim asked if, he, if I would do him a favor and take this stamp collection to his sister, right? Okay, so all the way over, I was trying to figure out what I was going to say to the immigration people, customs, because there's a stamp book like this thick, and I was looking through it, and there was a lot of money in there, <laughs> but I was to get it to his sister. So I get to uh, 
customs department, and these guys are staring at this mountain of electronic test equipment, and they didn't even see the, the stamp book. <laughs> <laughs> so, boom, I was out of there and got the handover uh, of the stamps and a satisfied customer. So I know working with you here, Neil, that you were doing many things. You were doing the switcher chassis designs, you were doing the airflow, you were doing power, you were doing controllers, you were doing panels. I'm kind of a jack of all trades. Yes, exactly. <laughs> One thing I did not get into was FPGA design. Right. Um, I had so many other things going on. That, yeah. Uh, and I managed to get through my career without <laughs> designing <Yeah>. FPGAs. <laughs> the other stuff's but, more fun anyway. Yeah, yeah lots of Lots of variety mm -hmm. of things. Mm -hmm. I was going through my list, and there's 14 different products that I, I worked on. Of course, wow. I'm allowed to because I was there for 42 years. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Anybody in the audience have any questions for Neil? All quiet. Okay, we'll get back to the whole panel later, but we don't want to forget last but least. Uh, Last person, uh-oh, oh no, there, Sally Price, okay. So what year did you start, 1978, employee number, low 500s, prior was McGuire Drafting Services, who convinced you to join Tom Milan? <laughs> he goes, who, me? <laughs> uh, manuals is what you were doing, uh, um, just under 40 years, that, that's something else. Um, lead for schematic drafters, design, senior designer. Um, I got a little story I can tell about Sally when we moved in here. She's going, oh no. So she had been working in this Envision uh, building and we moved over here. We moved the labs from Providence Mine and I was in charge with uh, Rick Foster and some others doing electrical and cable tray. So we had cable trays running throughout the building and um, we had this one cable tray. We're going to run right down the hallway and because uh, they wanted to save money instead of running cables up through the attic and over. So me and uh, Cowboy or Rick Foster are hanging the cable trays and Sally comes out of her office and goes, what are you guys doing? And we go, we're hanging cable tray. Right here in the hallway, we go, yes, we are. She goes, no, you're not. You're not doing it in my building. <laughs> so I tell Cowboy, hey, 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 hold off. She's mad. She's going to Scott Murray's office. Yeah. I don't care what she says, you know. <laughs> We're hanging these trays. <laughs> now, five minutes later, she comes out, and Scott Murray comes out and goes, hey, guys, uh, hold off. We're going to discuss some things here. So we went into the room and renegotiated what was a cost-saving thing to put an ugly cable tray down the hall, which I wasn't a big fan of anyway. Thank you for saving it, because the building looks better. But So when she retired, I gave her a little piece of cable tray. So. <laughs> I have it still, too. That's good. But, well, it turned out that we would have ended up having problems getting equipment in and out of the lab with the doors opening up with those cable trays. Yeah. But we just spent over $2 million. Three. To renovate this yeah. place, and yeah, I went, yeah. this is going to be a showcase, and you're going to have cable trays running down my hall? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> so that was good. She had her pride in what she did and where she worked and wasn't letting us get away with, again, as technical guys, sometimes uh, we're thinking about pennies and not uh, aesthetics as well. So they paid the extra 10000 to get it done, and it's there now, and it's been working, and um, anyway, so best best memory of Grass Valley Group. Uh, promotion to senior designer was one of them, but uh, what else? You got something good from Pitney Springs or? Well, Neil, I think we knew. Could talk into the mic if you would so they could hear. Thank you. We knew how lucky we were. You know, I mean, I didn't know the scope, but this is a family. We started, we were all super young, we didn't know, I didn't know what direction I was going to go in, and all of a sudden, you know, 
the world was my oyster. I could do anything that I wanted. You know, I started putting manuals together, and then Joanne McDonald came down and to my house in Yuba City and saw my portfolio because I was a drafter and I did architectural drawings, and the housing market had dried up, so I was looking at doing something else, and she goes, what are these? And I said, these are my my drawings. She goes, can I take them? And she took them up and put them out and gave them to Steve Dodge and said, why do we have a woman putting a manual together that can draw like this? Mm -hmm. So he took it to Val Marcus and said, what is going on? Why do we have her doing this when she should be possibly doing that? I was lucky a draftman C, drafter C opened it wasn't draftsman. We had gone a little bit more political correct. <laughs> a drafter C opened up, and I was hired. And the rest is all history. Mm -hmm. Everybody here, all of the engineers, all of the people we work with, they all, it was a collective effort to make each person the absolute best they could be. And we all love this place. We wanted every single Switcher, I worked one with Neil. There was 18 boards. It was the truck project. It was you, Danny, and myself. And then we hired people at Jabel in the Bay Area. And I flew down there once a week. And we had a thing called the Bible. And when you were finished with your ship, we were working 24 hours a day. Remember? We had drafters going, the whole, uh, designers going 24 hours a day. You'd write your, your book, we called it the Bible, and then you had an hour overlap to discuss what was being done, and the next person took off. And I flew on the company plane so many times to go down, and it was X1 prototype to release with no changes. 18 boards, and Danny Riswick did the mechanical with, with Neil, figured it all out, and we had one <coughs> switch that was, remember, it was off just a kilter. I mean, we're talking maybe three, four millimeters, but it was enough to where it didn't lay flat, and we were all going, <laughs> but it wasn't, we didn't have to turn it. It was a Vitronic switch. So I, I could go on and on and on about the stories, but it's true. Everybody made sure everybody else we're at their very best. And we celebrated, we cried when something wouldn't go right. I think it was Abacus that came out with perspective first. Ampex. Ampex. Ampex, excuse me, Ampex. And I was in a meeting and I was sitting next to Bernie Dayton and everybody is freaking out. And they had hired NASA engineers to, to do this, is that right? No, I, I run the <laughs> well, I, I, I'm just saying that was, you know, that's what I was told. But they said, and he looked at me and he goes, not to worry. It doesn't have to be done that way. We can do it another way. And we did. So whatever the challenge was, we did it. It was never, I can't do this. Yeah, I worked here in the building with you for, I don't know, a couple of years. And you always had a great attitude always upbeat, and, except when I was hanging cable tray, but <laughs> you're very good. It just looks very horrible. Good. <laughs> so it was fun working with you. Miss you. So. Anybody in the audience have anything they'd like to remember or ask for a question? Okay, Mona. Probably half. Most of the designers were women. Almost all of production. <laughs> but I mean, the you know designers and stuff, the schematic drafters. Yeah, there was true. there was a lot of women, which was extraordinary because when we went to classes or had people come in to do training, we were doing wire wrap instead of traces when we were you know, doing it by hand before we got into the computers in 1982, 82, 83, $1 million each 
and we got three of them. Steve Dodge and I sat next to each other, and we had to log on. You had two minutes to put in your password. <laughs> we never got it in. <laughs> I remember teaching you. Yes, you know. But uh, I, we, we were a phenomenon. Yeah. This industry here, this mm -hmm. broadcasting. Mm -hmm. I'm really amazed at our production department that prior to the digital products that we made, all the analog stuff was hand-wired. Yep. The uh, backplanes were all built by hand, just this huge spaghetti harness yep. with uh, each wire was color-coded so you could trace it without a uh, beeper. And uh, they would consistently build these things with no errors. It was very rare in systems tests that you had to call in a production person to uh, move a connector pin over. Uh, engineers weren't allowed to solder on, in <laughs> systems test either. Uh, they had to have a production person come over. Uh, Julie Doris still doesn't let me solder. Where is she? Is she still here? <laughs> she left. <laughs> uh, okay, so between everybody here, I, I'm just amazed that Grass Valley at Biddy Springs did everything. I mean, you guys had a machine shop. You had a wood shop, you had uh, PCB Photo. layout, you had PCB stuffing, you had people building cabinets to ship stuff out. I mean, and I half a dozen gardens as well. That's yeah. right. That's yeah. yeah. right. We had the beautiful gardens. Yeah, yeah. And ponds yep. out there. And uh, uh, I've been out to the site a couple of times, and we did a, a drone flyover and did some video footage that. Somebody else did it. I don't know what happened to it, but it's still a very nice place. Uh, yeah, kind of run down, a couple buildings, uh, but they have a school out there now, and uh, uh, Kara Gridley with uh, Curious Forge is out there, mm -hmm. and uh, it's still going on. We would we had beachcombers bikes. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. it had a basket in the front. Yeah. If you had That's to go right. to another building. You didn't have to walk. We also right. had a van that would come and pick you up if it was you were in a super big hurry. Otherwise, you'd ride mm -hmm. the bike from each building doing your business. I got a picture in the museum of Jane Sawyer. She looks about 15 years old <laughs> riding one of those bicycles. So, yeah. Yeah, we were worried that she wouldn't fit the seat. but. <laughs> <laughs> so... Right. Oh, yeah. And your yep. layout was four times. Four times scale, yes. <clears throat> yep. And then we'd use the browning machine and reduce it down to one to one, but it was four to one. Mm -hmm. Crawling around on the workbenches. Crawling around. Um, here we go. Here we go. I thought I'd talk about probably one of the craziest year in Grass Valley Group history was 1980, the Winter Olympics. Um, I started in field service about a year after Neil because they had all these switchers there made these promises to go around and change out these mixers. So I had the other set of test gear like that. And can you imagine going onto an airplane now with a 465 scope through security? <laughs> Did that all the time. <laughs> so um, about 79 or so, you left the service and went into engineering and you were right. working on the 300. And I kind of got tagged under Gordon Fellows to be the 300 service guy. So I moved out from Long Island out here in the end of uh, summer of 79. A couple weeks later, I went to ABC New York for six weeks to train the technical directors <laughs> how to run the 300. <laughs> so they'd shipped up, I think, that, I think it was the NAB switcher, which had, it would switch, do mixes, and do keys, but no wipes. That's not true. It had a wipe pattern. What? Just a split screen. Okay. <laughs> That's about a quarter of one of the ten whiteboards in each of the mix effects that was actually working. So um, I always wanted to go to the Olympics, but Merv was the GVG Olympic guy for a number of years. He went to Innsbruck and Montreal. But Merv had kind of left the 300 project, I think, at that point, because the company agreed to ABC to build a switcher to get it to the Olympics. And that's all engineering did for well over a year, was build one switcher. 
So one day, uh, I think it was Joe Maltz or somebody came to, over to me and he says, Merv, you're going to the Olympics. So I'm off, uh, up, um, uh, uh, I'm off to Lake Placid. So I came home uh, from the training and the plan was, I was to go to uh, Lake Placid just before Thanksgiving and fire up the 440 router. First 440 router. <laughs> and oh, by the way, Grass Valley Group built this four channel digital audio multiplex system for ABC, so that's the second first product. <laughs> the first 300, the first ISO phasing amplifier, so these were voltage variable delay lines so you could get things timed because they had to feed everything into two switchers. And I think we had uh, a 300 in one room, 1600 in another, we had like three 1As uh, running in edit bays. Uh, 21 <clears throat> one inch uh, tape machines were there. So anyway, I go out there to fire up the router. The idea was going to go to Rochester, see my folks during Thanksgiving, come back to California, go back out and do something with something else and come back. I never left. <laughs> <laughs> I walk in there the first day and all the ISO phasing amps are opened up with white tags on every board. I go, what's this about? He says, those are all blown up. Static had blown them all up. Oh, and oh, by the way, <laughs> this isn't working, and <laughs> that isn't working, and the 300 is there with no whiteboards in it, 10 boards per mix effects. No boards in there. So I just, working like crazy. So there's so much that I, basically, I got, you know, I could not get through it all. So I think during my time there, at least probably close to 16 people from Grass Valley came out there to work on and, and I had to get something running. But the big thing was the 300, because ABC had to have that switcher, had to have the clock wipe, had to have the star wipe and all this. And that was the very first 300. Yeah, it was the only one, because I, I, you didn't have, have one here, I think. So uh, about three weeks before they're going to go on the air, the whiteboards show up. I get these boxes and everything's wrapped up in bubble wrap and, you know, tube after tube of problems, and we plugged them all in, and there's all sorts of problems. So... Um, I'm in the engineering office, and, uh, and ABC had bought a second 1600, it was all in crates. And the word came down was that that switcher has to work in a week where we're gonna take it out and put a 1600 in. So what's it gonna take to do it? <clears throat> so I think we were on the phone with, um, now who was running the you know, engineering then? Was it Leon, I think? Yeah, or, uh, yeah, yeah, I think so. And, uh, and so the decision was made that we're gonna put Dave White, who, who was doing the software, Mike Patton, who was the hardware guy, uh, somebody else, and Roy with the Tektronics microprocessor development system and put them on the airplane and got them there like late the next day. And they set up in the, in the rack room and they wrote software and made this thing work and it went on the air. So just the mm -hmm. amount of uh, impact and the help and the people back here to make all that happen. Meanwhile, I'd find a board, something, some type of problem, I'd work on it. Back then we fixed boards, we didn't replace them. I found a little capacitor that went back. <coughs> didn't think of anything of it. The next day I'm working on something else, a whole different product, another little capacitor is bad. This happened over about a two week period. And I think I was saying to Leon one day, I said, you know, these little bypass caps, we have hundreds on each board. I keep finding them bad. He goes, oh, no, you just confirmed it that we do have a problem. So anybody here take and remember the green, uh, the green caps? Yep. So everything in the factory had to be changed. All the equipment from Lake Placid after the Olympics came back here, and all those were changed. And about five years later, I was up at one of the surplus sales up at the airport. And they had these plastic bags <laughs> filled full of green capacitors with no legs on them. <laughs> so, so the people back here could really make magic happen when it had, had to. So it was, uh, it was a wonderful time. It was very stressful to get all that done, but uh, the company pulled it off. So, listening to oh, here you go, here you go. Listening to what uh, Neil and Randy were saying about the 1980 Olympics, I have a very fond memory. 
Randy mentioned a 1600 switcher that was in crates. Okay, that was in crates. Well, uh, late in the in the late 70s, Bob Stillwell started a group called the Customs Group that. Uh, was in charge of building all of the custom 1600s. Um, ABC, uh, we said, always stood for always buy custom. They could never buy a switcher that was standard. There had to be something custom about it. So uh, for the Olympics, uh, the customs group tested about seven custom 1600 7Ks to get them all shipped off to all the control rooms for Lake Placid. Then at the last minute when things were getting a little iffy for the, uh, uh, the 300, my boss, Bob Stillwall, came to me and said, hey, if we can get you a, three, uh, a 1600 on Friday, can we ship it on Tuesday? This is a time when 1600 tests usually took about a week to two weeks on a, on a really good system. So I said, well, you know, I don't think so, but I, well, let's try. So the switcher was delivered to my test bay, and I started working on it, and I worked... 90 hours straight. Yep. Sally and I were um, married at the time, living in Yuba City. So I stayed in the Oatmeal Palace out at Bitney Springs, <laughs> working on the switcher, getting it tested. Sally would run back and forth, bring me dinner and, and breakfast and lunch and that sort of thing. Got that switcher tested, it shipped, and it sat in a warehouse for the duration of the Olympics. But <laughs> that's the kind of commitment. <laughs> <laughs> that's the commitment that Grass Valley Group had to the customers, and that's also one of the things that, that really made it uh, such a treasure to our customers. And then for the 300, when it did come back, you can verify this, Randy. The TD that ran the 300 was a cigar smoker, right? Uh, yeah, I think I believe so. Yeah. yeah. We'd sit in the back of the room at night because something would break on it every night during the show. So on the 300, on the first mix effects bank, there was only uh, there was a space between the uh, the effects or the um, uh, the cross point buttons and the uh, the effects head. There was a perfect size for his cigar ashtray. So we got that switcher back. It came back to the customs group after the duration of the Olympics, and there was cigar ash all over the place, and it was it was a complete mess. But we got it cleaned up and. Uh, got the system retested, updated, and shipped it back to ABC, and it probably stayed in use at uh, ABC for a number of years after that. And we won't even talk about the 300 retrofit program no. for. <laughs> okay. No. Thank you. Okay. Any uh, questions out of the group for the panel? Anything uh, we didn't cover? I think we did pretty good, and uh, it's great to see everybody and hear these stories. I know everybody in the group was telling me, oh, yeah, yeah, we want to hear these guys, some of these old stories. So it's been great. On your first digital project, did you do wire wrap, or did you actually finish production with uh, circuit boards? There were circuit boards, although the first digital boards were called multi-wire, yeah. and this that was a trademark of the Hitachi, the vendor. And <clears throat> you would enter your design schematic uh, digitally, and it would get crunched and produce instructions to this wiring machine that the circuit board, the ones that we used, were Big. 16 inches square or something like that and coated with some type of epoxy that was thermally sensitive. And there would be a stitching head on the machine with a, like a, probably a number 40 wire, very fine wire, that would run from point A to point B to make the connection. And it, of course it would avoid all the obstacles. And so there'd be a bazillion wires going horizontally and they could cross each other because they were insulated, uh, a bunch going vertically, and you could even go diagonally. And I don't know how many hours it would take on the machine to, uh, to build one board. Uh, so after the wires got stitched, then they'd drill the holes and plate them to make the connections to the ICs. 
And the whole reason for this was our volume was extremely low. Uh, you know, we, I don't know how many we built a year, but it was 20 or something like that. <clears throat> and it wouldn't support the tooling cost of uh, 15 layer circuit boards. Now we're, we're talking 80s technology yeah. here, or early 90s. Uh, so that was the method to build very complex digital boards in low volumes. But we never did wire wrap. We did. When, we did. <clears throat> yeah. The yeah. NEC we frames were wire wrap, and we had to do major rewrites. Uh, okay. Yeah. That was John Abbott's boards, right? I think so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's right. And they'd place them, they were chipped one right after another, a cap and a chip, you know, an IC chip, cap, the right, whole thing. Right. Yeah. You know, and it would, we'd use Daisy to bring it over and bring it into Intergraph. And that was in the, you know, it was C++, you know. Uh. My, my memory of wire wrap was the Dubner computer systems CBG2, which was an entirely, uh, you know, it was the way computers were built in those days. It was all wire wrap. So, you know, it worked. It was all right. It was all right until the first one that we took down to Australia for the IREE show. And so a CBG2 was a fairly substantial thing. It was about 14 rack units, something like that. It's a big, big chunk of metal. And uh, when the freight guys were unloading it at our booth, they weren't very careful. And they knocked it backwards on, onto its wire wrap pins <laughs> and bent every single pin on the back plane. And so about four of us sat there straightening pins with long nose pliers for 16 hours straight. <laughs> and, and there was no wiring diagram for it. it was done oh, no, no. The third party did the wire wrap. Yeah, yeah. And they never told Dubner what the wire wrap looked like. So Dubner couldn't actually. Do Tell us, the yeah. But the amazing thing was, when we straightened all the pins, it worked. <laughs> you know, going back further than wire wrap, the ancient days, of course, in the in the beginning, those little modules you see over there were just all straight lines of traces down, and somebody sat there with a drill. Oh, it was very the ball. Traces to interrupt them, and then you put components across, That's drill right. through holes, and so forth. Well, the next stage from that was actually with, uh, it was, we were very vertically integrated. We had our own, uh, you know, PC uh, boards that would, uh, you know, you give them uh, traces taped to mylar, those would be converted to boards. Well, back in the EMAM days when we did that, that was, uh, you'd call it today a skunk works project. There was mo no money allotted to it. There was no schedule allotted to it. There's nobody allotted to it. So in order to get those boards, there were a few people doing software and hardware, like Frank Way sat there hours and hours working on and early software for uh, AMIM. And then... Uh, I, don't know. Yeah. I know it's Mitch. last call, but come on. <laughs> Uh, Mitch Derrick pitched in with you know some time while he was there. I think Jim Dipbold did some software, but the early boards. In order to get those done, I went back into drafting, laid out the mylar, and did both sides of the bore, taping this stuff down at two, four to one, whatever it was. And actually, I still have some of those boards at home. Those boards came out. They were used in the original distribution. I saw numbers on them, so there were probably a number of those ships that were hand taped boards, but not by, you know, had to learn that myself to get this thing out. So, at any rate, <laughs> then we go from there to wire wrap, and the rest is done. Your way, I think. My daughter would pull off tape off my clothes, <laughs> and I'd have a heart attack because I'd look at it to see if the end was cut, you know, directly. We had an Uber knife, which was balanced and everything else, and I would lay them down to make sure I didn't accidentally rip a, a trace, <laughs> uh, you know, because they were, you know, multi-layer. It used to be just two-layer. 
And then we went into four layer and we were working, I think we worked something like 36 hours straight and it was three designers and Steve Dodge in the middle and then they'd get off and then three other designers and we were working on, you know, mylar this big. <laughs> and it was the end of one night and we looked up and the registration pin had slipped. <laughs> and we were all sitting there going, and Steve just went, I'm done. <laughs> we figured, we, we fixed it, you know. Really but I mean, done. once yeah. again, it was tons of hours, you know, just to get it done. Right. You know, predating Sally's entry into the drafting business, this goes back in the 60s when I worked at, at GE. I would uh, work between drafting and engineering and had my own set of draft uh, drawings and draft, uh, uh, drafting uh, personnel down there. Well, one day I was down there, squeezed in between these guys doing this stuff. Now, anybody that's worked in some of the old drafting stuff where you uh, worked on, what they call it, there was the copies, but you could erase lines. Oh, the mylars. The, not the mylars, but it oh. was... See, oh. you got to go way back on this. No, no, it was an At any rate, you if you wanted to change something on a drawing rather than redoing the whole drawing, you had a copy of it. And then you worked on that, and you very carefully threw out the ones you don't want and then put in the lines that you do want. Okay, so I was standing there looking over my guy looking, and I stepped back to, uh, to leave, and I heard this, uh, uh, and I turned around, and I saw this draft, and I bent, bumped into his chair, and he took this bottle of eradicator and oh, no. spilled it on his whole drawing. And I stood there with him as we watched the whole drawing disappear. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, I think we're uh, wrapping up. I'm going to give each one of the guest panelists a plaque from Simpty that says a uh, certificate of appreciation presented to Bill Rorden. Grass Valley Group's 60th anniversary, reliving the golden years and today's date. Mm -hmm. So each one of them is going to get one of these plaques from Sempty. And we really appreciate you guys coming and doing this.